Hi, this is Sean Cahill, and you're listening to That UFO Podcast. I'd like to thank Motley Fool for sponsoring this episode. I've said before on ads that looking after yourself financially gets harder and harder with the cost of everything going up. Being a tight Scotsman, I use every method I can possible to save a little here or make the most of what I have there. Motley Fool is one way that you can definitely look to maximise your income from investments. The age of stock picking is here with towering inflation and elevating interest rates. Sticking your money in a passive market just isn't going to get you what it used to, but it doesn't mean you have to abandon the market. There are still ways to invest invest for the future. You just need to know where to look, which is where The Motley Fool comes in. The Motley Fool Stock Advisor Service highlights two stocks each and every month for members to add to their portfolios, and it literally is paid to listen to them. Historically, their average stock recommendation is up over 400% as of April 10th, 2023. And listeners of That UFO Podcast can now access Motley Fool Stock Advisor for just $89 for their first year, a full $110 off the list price. What are you waiting for? Visit fool.com slash podcast. That's F-O-O-L dot com slash podcast to start your investing journey today. $110 discount off of $199 per year list price. Membership will renew annually at the then current list price. Hi everyone and welcome back to That UFO Podcast. This Tuesday, April 18th at 10 Eastern, 9pm Central, The Secret of Skinwalker Ranch makes its return to the History Channel, now going into its fourth season. Ranch owner Brandon Fugel and the team are back to continue their investigations to unravel the mysteries of the ranch. I've been fortunate to speak to Brandon himself, Thomas Winterton, Bryant Arnold, aka Dragon and Travis Taylor all on the podcast. And finally, I'd like to welcome my guest today, another of the crew from Skinwalker Ranch. He is the Chief Scientist and Principal Investigator on the Ranch. I should also mention a highly accomplished physicist, Mr. Eric Bard. Eric, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Andy. I'm glad we could uh, connect. I don't take it for granted that we'll be able to do that out here at the ranch, so it's a pleasure. Yeah, I, I was just saying before I hit record that I was surprised when the camera came on and the background was all the screens that I'm used to and stuff, which is a pretty cool little moment. So if you're listening to this on audio, you, uh, Eric is currently in the command center at the ranch, yeah? Yes, I am. I'm in the control room. The control room, one you'll be very familiar with if you've watched the Skinwalker Ranch series. Uh, I am in the shed where it's just a black background. So if you're watching on YouTube, hi, you've got the you've got the scenic uh, part of this as well. Eric, listen, let's get down to it. A um, lot of questions to ask you and not a lot of time. I want to find out first, how did you first get involved with Skinwalker Ranch and, and Brandon Fugel? Well, you know, those are... Uh, two separate questions, really. So I met Brandon probably, oh goodness, it was uh, 2011. Uh, we worked together on uh, another project, uh, also of a somewhat speculative nature. And uh, through my work with Brandon, I think, you know, he immediately realized what a what a straight shooter I tend to be when it comes to speculative subject matter. And so, you know, that was a, that was a very interesting project. We brought it to a close. Uh, some years later, Brandon made me aware that he was considering the purchase of this property, this, this very strange, infamous Skinwalker Ranch. And I remember the first message that I received from him was something of a of a, of a proposition, an indecent proposal, if you will. He was he said, "Hey, you know, I'm looking at purchasing this this remarkable property. How would you like to go out there and and live? It could be your kingdom." And I said, uh, "Tell me a little more about it." And after after he filled me in on on what this place was all about, I said, "You first. <laughs> now th- that's that's it is that it you literally got the offer and you up sticks and you moved to the ranch essentially yeah uh no not at all in fact it's kind of funny because uh you know i i remember i, I received probably a half a dozen invitations to come visit the property after the, after the purchase uh went through and um, you know, I, I i took a, a pass on it i thought to myself this is probably not for me, um, interesting, yes, but uh, I just didn't feel that it was um, it was something that I wanted to engage with initially. Um, I remember at, at, at one point, a few months after he he made the purchase, uh, I was invited into a meeting with uh, some of the people formerly engaged in the research, and so of course I was curious to meet with those individuals, some of whom I had known from previous work, and. Um, 
that's when I became a bit more intrigued as, uh, as some of the high level uh, summary material was shared with me. I thought, yes, this would be, this would probably be uh, uh, interesting to explore at least superficially. So, uh, you know, my first visit to the ranch uh, was in October of 2016. Uh, I believe that was October the 14th. Did you know much about the ranch? You mentioned you were hesitant to accept that first offer and it took a few kind of a bit of persuading. And Brandon's a very persuasive guy, I'm sure. Uh, I've spoke to him a couple of times. Did you know much about the ranch before you went out? You know, it's interesting. The first time I heard the term skinwalker, goodness, that would have been in... 1993, and honestly, it just didn't it didn't make any sense to me. Uh, but for some reason, the, uh, the I should I should explain that the 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 concept of the skinwalker was shared with me by someone of Native American descent, someone of Navajo descent, in fact, and he he described to me this this um, entity, if you will, uh, and and he pronounced the the uh, the Navajo word, which I will not attempt to. Um, replicate here for fear of embarrassing myself. Um, but I, that word stuck in my mind uh, in, in 93. And I and, and for whatever reason, you know, it, it came back to me now and again. And over the years, um, you know, the subject itself of Skinwalker Ranch was not known to me. Uh, I think I heard something about it maybe in 2012 or 2013. It sounded very far-fetched. It sounded as if you had basically a mashup of every paranormal theme and meme convergent upon one uh, one property, which of course seems really improbable. Um, and so I put it out of my mind again, and it did not come back into focus until Brandon's uh, initial overture. Um, so um, really no front loading, uh, to be honest, or minimal front loading in terms of what I make of that concept of a skinwalker or of any of the attendant phenomenology. So you've gone in with a pretty open mind, not too much of an expectation, hearing all sorts of stories that people might be familiar with or, or not. Sure. What exactly is your role on the ranch? You know, um, the role has been evolving since the very beginning. Uh, after my initial visit, which I should mention was a very eventful visit, uh, much to my surprise. When, when I came on site, I think it was a contingent of, of 11 individuals and uh, quite frankly, some things took place that I did not expect uh, at all. Um, and that left me with quite an impression. I volunteered uh, very tentatively to uh, take a look at any data, uh, anything that might be shared uh, through channels. Uh, and uh, really, it was not a formal engagement. It was an, an engagement bef between friends. You know, I'm a, I, I consider myself a uh, close associate, if not a friend of Brandon. And so I said, let, let me take a look at what you've got. And so I began uh, in my free time analyzing, uh, for example, photographs and other things that were shared uh, beginning in the, in the 2016 timeframe. And I should mention, uh, there was no payload of data from the previous investigations. A lot of people probably have the understanding that, that you know, the NIDS and Basara investigations uh, probably produced uh, quite a bit of data and that we might have inherited that. And I, sh I should make very clear that we did not. Uh, and, and I suppose there are, are pluses and minuses to this because we, again, are not front loaded. Uh, but at the same time, we're, 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 we're starting from essentially uh, dead center. We're, we're starting from zero. So as the material was shared with me and I began looking at, at uh, photographic evidence and other things, um, I didn't quite know what to make of it. I began uh, uh, reviewing surveillance footage, again, informally engaged. Uh, there was really uh, no expectation that this would go any further than uh, sharing a few uh, side notes. But then it just continued to evolve. Uh, to, to evolve. We, we've been led uh, by the data, beginning with very austere beginnings, uh, you know, just a minimal surveillance presence, minimal electronic footprint, and it has just continued to, to progress. And as unusual things have come forward in the data, we've decided to deploy additional resources and spend uh, additional time. I wonder, going back to those early days, if someone could have slipped you the NIDS and BAS data, knowing what you know now, would, would you take a look at that file in the data? Or do you think it's been a good thing, like you say, to, to kind of start from scratch and put your own stamp and authority on it? Well, you know, it, 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 I, I went into the initial meeting that I described to you earlier with some expectations that I would probably see this this payload of really 
uh, interesting data pertaining to all the things. I mean, look, uh, the context here is obviously one that includes uh, that topic of interest to you, UFOs, UAPs, uh, but also uh, things to which we refer by names like orbs and portals and, you know, interdimensional phenomena. And so, of course, I was, I was as curious as anyone would be. And certainly as a physicist, I was curious to see what they had, had found. Um, I was actually quite surprised that what we received were only the highest level uh, summaries there were no video records, for example, shared. There were no um, data files. And so to your question, I think at that time, I would have voraciously consumed any data that would have been shared with me. Looking back on it, I, 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 I have mixed feelings. You know, I've said publicly that, that curiosity alone on my part is not entitlement to, to answers. Nevertheless, now that I've got more than skin in the game here, I would really like to know uh, exactly what uh, was seen, what was measured, perhaps. And I still hold out hope that at some point in the future, we might be able to compare notes with with those uh, previously involved. I think for the UFO topic, that's a fascinating statement that curiosity is not entitlement for answers, because I think that's that would apply to many. And I think that can come across for all of us sometimes that there's an entitlement that we should know what's going on. And that's a whole hotbed of debate on its own, isn't it? Um, well, Andy, I, I, sorry to interrupt, but I'll, no, I'll no, just... Go. I'll jump in and I'll say, you know, sometimes when I say something like that, you know, I can see eyes glazing over. People don't understand. It seems kind of non sequitur to my role that I would make such a statement. I am, after all, the principal investigator. And so, you know, when I say um, I don't presume entitlement to the data uh, collected during the Nids and Bass era, it's because I entertain at least uh, the possibility that there may be, in fact, a very good reason, even a virtuous reason, and one that I would support for the non-disclosure of the things that were netted during the during the time of, of that previous uh, set of investigations. It's possible, um, and so I, you know, I approach this with a with um, not a sense of entitlement, certainly a, a sense of very intense curiosity um, and reverence. But you've also gone in with a work ethic to go and find those answers and put in the work. And, you know, you're, you're, you're in this command center right now as we do this. Um, I just want to ask again, before we start to look at the, the time, at, your time on the ranch, you mentioned your first visit was eventful. Was your first visit the first time you had an experience with anything on the ranch? And is that something you can discuss? Uh, yeah, certainly I can. Um, I, I, and please jump in and, and interrupt me if I'm diving too deeply into the details because it's all very vivid in my mind. Um, you know, I remember coming out with uh, some individuals whom we might identify as VIPs. Um, I certainly didn't count myself among them. Um, I, I came as, as, as an observer determined to be as unobtrusive. Uh, you know, I remember my thoughts at the gate just as we, as we paused before we uh, passed through the gate were, um, uh, to just still myself on the inside, pay attention to anything that I might be picking up on, given uh, what I had been told about the ranch and about its, its uh, uh, influence on some individuals uh, previously, some things that we might sense. Um, and I remember, you know, considering whether or not I should actually go through the gate and whether I should uh, um, enter the property. I was fully prepared on that very first day to wait outside uh, for, for the others to go inside. And, and I would just linger outside if I had to, uh, had my impressions given me that, that, uh, that strong sense, but, but that didn't happen. I went inside and of course, um, uh, just looked around inside of this, this building where I am now. Uh, of course it was in a very different condition. Uh, we've done a lot of renovation here, uh, but I saw it in its original state, walked around through the rooms. Uh, and then we went, out onto the property itself and uh, as a group went uh, to the base of the Mesa, uh, just to the west of where I'm sitting now. And um, one of the very first unusual things that I observed was that when I separated myself from the group, I went to the top of the Mesa, uh, essentially to get a photograph uh, or a panorama. And I noticed that the mobile device that I was carrying, it was an iPhone 5, was misbehaving. I'd never seen that kind of behavior before. And uh, so I called down to the group and I said, hey, you know, something's happening with my phone here. Uh, is anybody else seeing anything like this? And, you know, I was having to yell down to this group at the base of the Mesa and some of them looked up and um, shook their heads. And so they got their phones out reluctantly, took a look and uh, no one else was seeing anything unusual happening with their devices. 
And, and uh, one of the individuals yelled up to the top, time to get a new phone, Eric. Um, and so um, I didn't I didn't read too much into that, but boy, it was it struck me as strange because it was what I would describe as a very violent disruption of the normal behavior of the phone. It was very uh, non-responsive. And interestingly, when Brandon heard that, when he heard my announcement, he of course was was uh, excited to see what I was seeing. So he he comes running up the side of the mesa, um, wearing his usual attire, um, and uh, which is not exactly suitable for climbing up the side of a mesa. And interestingly, just as he got to the top of the mesa, what I was seeing happen on the, on the phone stopped. And uh, and so there was a moment of embarrassment for me, of course, because it, it, effectively I had just cried wolf, or or something, and and uh, someone. Uh, captured a photograph of us uh, from down at the base of the Mesa, both staring intently as if praying to our phones to see if we would uh, detect what I had uh, had described earlier. Um, it never came back while we were on top of the Mesa. Then as we uh, descended, we went as a group out to the to the old homesteads, which I, I assume you're familiar with. Um, something very interesting happened there uh, a second time. Um, several of us experienced... Um, I guess vertigo would be the best term for it. I remember hopping off of the UTV and, and feeling like I couldn't find level ground. No matter how I stood or where I stood, it just wasn't level ground. And what caught my attention was that um, some of the other visitors to the, to the property could be heard speaking with each other saying, wow, did you feel that? It's as if the ground was spinning just now. And I thought, wow, that's unusual because I hadn't said anything to them. So, uh, uh, it, there was something simultaneously going on uh, with that group and with me as the last uh, arrival to that area. And I, uh, of course, got the, fo- the, the phone out again to take some pictures. And again, I was seeing that same uh, behavior. And you better believe I was, I was quick to call people over to take a look at it. I didn't want to cry wolf a second time. So I did get other eyes on it and I got a, a couple of screenshots. It was very strange. Uh, the remainder of the day was also uh, very eventful. Um, we had... Um, the, the sighting that you've probably heard uh, Brandon uh, describe publicly of something darting around uh, very abruptly, irregularly over the Mesa. This was witnessed by two other individuals, um, and I have their, uh, their testimony. And remarkably, without any, without any um, collaborative effort, what they've described to me is exactly the same thing. Um, and of course, uh, you may also be aware of the fact that we had an individual who was um, medically impacted uh, by his time uh, out at the homesteads, uh, basically catatonic, lost about uh, f- uh, 10 minutes of time, and then experienced a very severe uh, medical episode after he returned to his uh, original location. So a lot of things happened on that day, and uh, sorting that out, looking at a lot of pictures that were collected pixel by pixel, uh, became uh, my preoccupation for several weeks. I know that was kind of long, but you no, know, it's, no, it's, it's in my mind. <laughs> it's it's perfect. Thanks for sharing that. And many of those types of incidents have been repeated over the years. When I spoke to to Bryant, you know, Dragon, I spoke to Thomas Winterton. They both mentioned how often the cameras themselves filming the series would fail because of issues with batteries that were fully charged. And they, they made the point that it's frustrating that that's something they can't actually film because it's the filming equipment itself that fails and has the issue. So they are something yeah. that doesn't even make it onto the show because oh, right. batteries are gone. Did you charge the battery? Yep, this is a full battery. The backup's dead as well. And they have to go and sort all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's really commonplace, isn't it? it? Well, it is. And, and you know, I, I absolutely sympathize with those who... Um, are tempted to criticize the effort as being, um, well, at least confusing because of the fact that we are able to successfully film the series where, you know, we do have drone shots, we do have obviously camera and audio work. Um, and so, so some have, have asked and rightly so, well, if the phenomenology affects your, your technology, then why are you able to even do this? Mm. And, 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 you know, there's a word that we use, I think too frequently, I'd love to have another word. Um, but really we have, uh, what we call a transient, uh, phenomenology here. It comes and goes, it's fleeting. And so uh, many of these uh, events, these irregularities that happen with our equipment, both in front of the camera, behind the camera and inside the camera, uh, uh, come at unpredictable, uh, times completely uncorrelated with, uh, certainly with our expectations or any of our experimental intentions. 
I wonder as a scientist and uh, someone who is driven by data and facts and statistics, how much of this phenomenon have you managed to piece together? I suppose, let me ask, if you had a 100-piece jigsaw, which was the overall secret to Skinwalker Ranch, how many bits of the jigsaw does Eric have in place just now? I really like the way you frame that question and it makes it really hard because see, I don't know, I don't know the size of the puzzle. In fact, although you've stated it as a 100 piece puzzle, we honestly don't know how many pieces we're dealing with here. So uh, let me, let me approach the question this way. You know, you, you cite the fact that I'm a physicist and so of course I bring certain um, proclivities. I bring certain expectations, I guess, into the picture. We do use the tools and methods of science. Uh, although I have sometimes protested and loudly that what we are doing is not exclusively to be treated as a science endeavor. It's not a science project alone, uh, but certainly those, those tools and methods do serve us well. Um, and so um, I've compartmentalized the, um, the things that have been shared with us in the, in the inherited narrative as well as the things that have been unfolding in the, in the time since, uh, since I came on, on site. Um, and I've said, look, you know, we, we might be dealing with, with um, a misunderstanding of what could be just natural phenomena. Uh, in, in fact, I like to say nature's got talent. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we could be looking at some obscure, perhaps very complex geophysical phenomena t- playing out, or we could be looking at atmospheric phenomena or, or some interplay between the two. Um, and then, of course, you know, that would be considered one sandbox. Another sandbox would be that we are, in fact, dealing with some of the things that obviously interest you and, and me as well and many of your viewers, and that is maybe we're dealing with something related to off-world uh, technology uh, and entities like the UFOs and, and so forth. And then it gets even deeper. We talk about things like interdimensionals, mm. uh, you know, an entirely different class of, of, of being. And, um, and then there, of course, is the sandbox of, um, you know, the, and I don't, I don't really want to dwell in this sandbox too much, but there is the conspiratorial sandbox that says that this is, this is us, but not us here as the team, but the other us. In other words, human beings who may be doing something of a covert nature. Um, I don't want to explore that too much, but I realize that that is something of of great concern to some of the people who engage this narrative. And so there are multiple sandboxes, as many really as five. Um, And so I've just decided that as I collect the data, I want to do so with as little bias as possible and to let the data self-assemble. And we'll find out which sandbox has the most sand in it the end of the day and at this time are you still very much looking at it from that bird's eye view of the sandboxes you've not you're not hanging your hat on any one idea just yet i think that would be fair to say um you know there's a there's a really there's so many interesting topics that converge at this site as i mentioned in the early going it seems like such an improbable uh nexus you know we've got I, I've, I've joked that it seems like we've got uh, everything that may have hit the cutting room floor in the making of uh, science fiction series like the X-Files. You know, it just seems like we've got so much material coming together, so improbable. And so, of course, as a physicist, and I think even, even those who don't identify as scientists would, would, would sympathize with this, I'm looking for explanations that have unifying appeal. And what I mean by that is those explanations that can account for all of this apparently disparate uh, uh, phenomenology. How is it that we get these these orbs and these portals and these UFOs and these disembodied voices and strange, uh, uh, sometimes um, menacing uh, medical effects on on individuals? We also have, uh, I I would assume you're familiar with the terminology hitchhiker effect. In other words, some of the the phenomenology following members of our team home. Uh, Obviously, these are things that interest and concern our audience and probably yours. Um, How do we come up with with an explanation that that brings this all under one umbrella? And so um, one of the, um, I'll call it a theory, but one of the Maybe I'll call it just an idea. One of the ideas that, that, that I have uh, volunteered 
incorporates the observer as a co-causal agent. In other words, the observer participates in the generation of the phenomenology. I realize that's very speculative, but it does have unifying appeal, and it may help to account for things like the off-site effects, including the, the so-called hitchhiker effect. Interesting. A bit like mixing two different chemicals and then keeping one chemical mixing another, they're going to give you different reactions depending on what's along there. Um, I've spoken to George Knapp about the hitchhiker incidents. He said even his wife has had experiences like that. Thomas Winterton, I know, talked about that as well. And it, it's one of the more spotlighted elements of the UFO phenomenon over the last couple of years. Books like Skinwalkers at, at the Pentagon, obviously. James Lakatsky, Colm Kelleher, George Knapp have, have discussed these ideas too. Um, let me ask you, Eric, in your time on the ranch, it's now been from the TV point of view, it started in April 2020, so we're into our third year, fourth season. What have been some of your standout moments? I'm just going to be a really unprofessional and bring the interview back in now, folks. And I'm dreading telling you this because, as I've just said to Eric in the pause of the recording, um, Eric was in the middle of answering the question I asked him. The recording stopped completely. I could hear Eric. It gave me an error message. Everything shut down, but I could still hear and um, we've had to restart the interview. However, we've got everything saved. Well, actually, I've not checked that yet. It should be saved from before. I imagine it will be given the information I've got. But typically, and this isn't to advertise Skinwalker Ranch, you know, starting Tuesday, 18th of April, <laughs> there's been a little bit of a, a tech problem going on there, Eric, which isn't unusual given what we've just been talking about. Um, could have been anything. Let's just say that. Yes. I, I and, and I appreciate that statement. I, you know, you, you're saying exactly what I say in every instance. It could be anything, and um, if you'd like, we can we can go back into that question, and I'll 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 be glad to fill in any gaps that may have been left by the interruption. Yeah, um, I was asking you about um, your your standout moments. You were mentioning some of the local astronomers who had had visited. And then kind of got a bit fuzzy and cut off. But if you want to go from there, we'll 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 leave that little bit in. Certainly. So from, uh, from among the events that have been shared uh, specifically within the series, um, as I was explaining earlier, and as I will rehearse again, one of the most um, interesting, or as you said, standout moments uh, would have to be what took place uh, during the astronomy exercise. You know, these are uh, subject matter experts, these astronomers who came on site having among them, uh, you know, in the aggregate, decades of experience of working with uh, telescopes, uh, computer-driven telescopes that contain a closed system star catalog uh, a computer that drives those instruments. Um, and when I say closed system, I'm referring to uh, the fact that the computers don't have, uh, for example, a Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, or Ethernet connection. And we saw uh, what we all uh, interpret as interference, direct as if volitional interference with the, um, with the contents of that, of that uh, closed system star catalog. Um, to, to, to rehearse for those who may not be familiar with what we were up to, we were interested in observing uh, possible changes in starlight as selected or pre-selected stars uh, would traverse a region of the sky as seen from the helipad here uh, near the command center. Uh, there's a region in the sky to which we have given the name the anomaly. Uh, and uh, we've had some other exercises that have uh, played out very strangely uh, in the skies above the ranch. And so we decided that uh, one way of going about the study of that region is to use telescopes and look for changes uh, in the starlight, perhaps positional changes, focusing, defocusing, changes of the spectral content, anything that might give us a clue into what's happening in that space above the ranch. So we pre-selected the stars, and at the time when those stars were um, uh, about to pass through that, that selected region, uh, it is as if they were individually removed uh, from the star catalog, which it is classically impossible as far as we know. Um, Obviously, it was it was um, it was very disturbing. Uh, I can only imagine what was going through the mind uh, of the minds of our guests, the astronomers. Um, I know how I would have felt. Probably a bit of embarrassment, maybe mild panic that that my equipment was malfunctioning. Look, we've all been there. Um, I feel like I'm there all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
And, uh, and so, um, we observed that just at those moments that were really the center point of our intended scientific investigation for that, for that evening, those stars were being uh, selectively removed in a way that we just don't understand. And it is very tempting to read volition. In other words, uh, the idea that we are dealing not just with a something, but a someone, a someone intelligent, as has been described to us uh, by those uh, who were involved in the work uh, previously. I'm talking about NIDS and Bass era personnel. Uh, the phrase that they've used, I might as well share it here and now. You know, there's a phrase, uh, sentient, precognitive, non-human intelligence. It's quite a mouthful. But there is an example in which we undertook to do a, I think, uh, well-defined uh, scientific exercise with a clearly stated, uh, testable, falsifiable hypothesis. And what happened? Something completely perpendicular to our intentions. And it is it is so often the case here on the ranch. I'll share one more with you if, if we have time for it, Andy. Please, yeah. Um, you know, I remember this wasn't uh, part of the series, but it was part of, of a public-facing uh, visit. We had a, a news crew who came out to do a uh, what would what I assumed would be a very short piece, a visit on the ranch, just to familiarize uh, you know the the locals here in the state of Utah with what we're up to. Um, they came out to visit. It was a a, a man and a woman, um, and uh, uh, they brought with them a drone uh, and a camera, of course, a, a, a nice. A, a large camera and some uh, of those smaller um, cube cameras or GoPro cameras uh, as part of the interview uh, process. They, they decided to interview me first. Uh, they came into this room where I'm sitting now and they were asking about the history, you know, and we go through the obligatory uh, rehearsal of how I got involved, just as we have here. Um, and th th then we then we sort of got into the to the meat of of what we're up to, and they were asking about this strange phenomenology. And I, I began to describe the uh, magnetic aspects of the, of the phenomenon as I infer them. Uh, I believe that there is a strong transient, high field, high gradient uh, uh, magnetic influence that moves through this space here sometimes. And as I began to describe that, uh, one of the little cube cameras uh, went dead. We were interrupted for uh, to deal with that. And they said, well, that's really strange. It says the battery's dead and we just charged the battery. You know, you, you can probably predict how the course of this conversation. They got a second cube camera out and uh, and they weren't able to connect to that. I think they were able to conduct the, the interview with the big camera. But I, I had just explained to them that uh, there are technological and even neurological effects due to uh, um, the kind of magnetic influence that I just described, this high field, high gradient, transient magnetic field. Well, interestingly, when they wrapped up the interview with me, they went out onto the, uh, onto the deck behind the command center. Um, and I was just relieved that the interview was over because I'm not, I guess I'm not the most graceful when it comes to being interviewed. I, I like to get those over with. <laughs> um, and so I was, I was relaxing a bit. I went to the refrigerator to get a drink, looked out the window and I saw, uh, the, the videographer, uh, the, the videographer, uh, Megan, was looking uh, uh, perplexed at her, her drone controller. Uh, she had what I call the inverted happy face. And, uh, and so I, I, I sensed that something was up. So I poked my head out the door. And of course, Brandon's very excited. He always is when something like, like unusual is going on, going on. And he says, come, 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 take a look at this. And so they show me the controller or the, the display on the controller for the drone. And in fact, the message was something to the effect, and I'm paraphrasing, excessive magnetic interference detected, uh, please relocate. Uh, you know, it was, the drone uh, was inoperable until that, that issue was dealt with. Now that was literally uh, just minutes after having had that conversation. And so, um, you know, when I, when I tell people that I sympathize with the, with the view that perhaps we are being surveilled and that there is a some oneness to the phenomenology. These are examples of why I say that. Now, let me ask, as we start to kind of wrap up a little bit on the Skinwalker Ranch discussion, I want to take it slightly outside of that for the last part of the interview. If money was no object, and Brandon funding this operation has been very generous, I'm sure he would yes, say yes. so himself, and, and everyone else has, to be fair. Um, if money was no object, 
how would you take the investigation forward? Say the History Channel come and say, Eric, season five, it's all on you. Here's the budget. It's $500 million. What are you doing with that money? Oh, my goodness. Well, I'm concerned that if I answer that question, it might be preemptive of things that you are (laughs) planning to do. (laughs) Um, Gosh, I have to tread lightly. Uh, There is a concept that I've shared. Um, I think I can say this. I hope that I'm I hope that I'm not out of line uh, when I describe this. I I, I have shared this in in other venues. It it is a, a, a distributed detector array. It is a concept that I um, came up with uh, back in 2017, really. Uh, and the idea I know is something that will that will resonate with lots of folks who uh, who follow the physics or who share the mindset of a physicist. Um, you know, we have these localized effects. We have certain areas on the ranch that are notorious for high strangeness and for interference with devices and so forth. And there is this speculation that we might be looking at effects generated by some sort of GR or general relativistic generating um, um, device or even craft. You know, what we are talking about potentially UAPs or UFOs. So imagine something that, that distorts uh, what we call space time. Um, you know, perhaps uh, if we have a grid of detectors uh, across the property, and this would be a very expensive and complex uh, thing to pull off. But if you imagine, uh, you know, a Cartesian grid of the of, of, of a multi-sensor packages, um, not communicating with each other, but independently registering local conditions, electric field, magnetic field, uh, infrasonic, uh, seismic, um, you know, anything that, that we might uh, consider in scope, including GPS measurements, uh, and I'll explain why that's, that's relevant here. Um, what we might see is what, what we should expect to be uh, uncorrelated effects suddenly becoming correlated. In other words, effects moving coherently across the property, uh, moving around as if to... to uh, bear out the presence of something moving through our space. Um, now, I mentioned GPS. Why, why GPS? Well, you know, we have devices down here at or near ground level that receive signals from what we call middle Earth orbit. You know, it's not geosynchronous orbit and it's not low Earth orbit, but it's, you know, somewhere in between. And those signals that are sent by the GPS, you know, generally GPS, GLONASS, BETO, um, those, those satellites are broadcasting uh, signals down to our sensors and the timing on those, the, the arrival time of those signals is in fact what enables the uh, measurement of position. Mm-hmm. And so if we have a GPS sensor down at or near ground level and we ask the sensor, where are you? Where are you? We continue to do this over and over and over as rapidly as we can and data log the answers that we receive. If we suddenly see a perturbation in that position, uh, not just in one, but in many of those uh, devices in that grid that I've just described, it might in fact bear out the movement of some uh, something with spatial extent going across the property. So that's the concept. So you asked me if money was no object. I would certainly uh, put that high on my list of, of projects that I would engage. I would create what I call my light garden, uh, the, the multi-sensor array. So um, I'm not a scientist or, or that intelligent, but it makes me think a little bit like if someone was skipping a stone across a pond and each time the stone hits the water, it creates that kind of, you know, expansion and you could measure the stone going across the water each time it hits. Andy, that is, that is a brilliant analogy. In fact, I wish I'd made it. And I'm not saying that to ingratiate myself. That is exactly the kind of thing that we'd be looking for. In fact, I've done some simulations. You, you, you see a, a rendering of the ranch behind me uh, in one form. I've done uh, some uh, hypothetical models of wave propagation and reflection off of the mesa itself, you know, looking at exactly that kind of thing. So don't sell yourself short. No, interesting. I'll, I'll Thanks. Good answer. Yeah, I like that. Um, what are some of your views on the current progress of the UAP conversation going on in, in Congress with the potential for, for UFO hearings being on the horizon? You know, I, I'm encouraged that those that those uh, hearings are taking place. Um, look, uh, my expectations have been um, fairly low 
just because of the history. Uh, I, I, I'm not a cynic, but I just don't, I don't expect much to come from those. Uh, or I'll say prior to the current era, I haven't expected much to come of those hearings. Um, but having visited uh, with uh, members of the, uh, the Senate uh, Intelligence uh, Committee um, uh, and having briefed them on, uh, on the early stages of our work here, and having seen how receptive and interested they were in what we had to share, um, I, I would say that I have um, higher hopes uh, that we will see something uh, uh, that at least gives us um, greater insight into what we've been seeing in our skies for generations now. And I wonder, regarding the the data that you collect, this was a, one of the listener questions. I've tried to fire some of these into the body of the interview. Um, You've obviously have a situation where it's an ongoing scientific endeavor, but like you say, not exclusively. You've got a, a TV show that's being filmed and made as well. So there's a whole lot of moving parts. But as we talk now in 2023, there are quite a lot of uh, other groups popping up, for example, the Galileo Project, uh, UAPX and, and others. Is there any attempt or plans where you could potentially share data with these groups or get data from these groups to kind of aid your own investigations? I, 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 I think so. I absolutely think so. Um, we're very open to that. Um, I know that uh, Brandon has been uh, personally in contact with uh, the principals uh, for the Galileo project that you mentioned. Um, I, he had some uh, very positive initial impressions of his meetings with, with those who are involved. Um, I have personally met with members of UAPX, fine gentlemen. Um, you know, there are um, obviously very different approaches to the same problem set, and I think we need that. Uh, you know, uh, we have d different people with different skill sets and backgrounds and, and frankly, different uh, funding models. Uh, and so I, I suppose as we aggregate the things that we learn here at the ranch uh, with things learned elsewhere um, and things uh, coming out of other investigations, there's a very good chance that, that uh, when we put these things together, you know, as the saying goes, um, the whole will be greater than the sum of its parts. And just to round off, Eric, what can people look forward to in the upcoming season of The Secret of Skinwalker Ranch? Oh, now you're trying to get me in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, non-spoiler, non-spoiler version. No spoilers. I have to tell you, you know, um, I have not watched the series for a number of reasons. Uh, you know, I've, I've, it's in good hands. You know, we, we uh, have during the first four, or, sorry, the first three seasons, you know, the, the material was shot. And, uh, you know, I haven't watched uh, the result uh, uh, unless... With, with rare exception, I've seen I've seen parts of, of various episodes, you know, when my arm is twisted behind my back, I'll sit through it and I'll, I'll watch myself and cringe. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, it's just, it, I guess it goes with the territory. But, um, you know, I've refrained from watching it with the argument being, you know, hey, I've, I've lived it once and once is enough. Um, this year, I've taken a different approach. I've, I've taken the opportunity to look at some of the rough cut material. And I have to tell you, um, it is chilling to me as, as, as a participant in that work. And I can only imagine, you know, I have to say I have mixed feelings about what's going to happen. I know how this is going to strike people. Um, I know there are going to be some, um, um, there are going to be some very uh, important questions. Uh, there are going to be some very acute um, scrutiny <laughs> And I don't know how to I, I, I don't know how to prepare for it other than to say, you know, if we can engage uh, in a spirit of a collaborative spirit, um, you know, I think we can get through this. Um, this set of very unusual results that are about to be shared and hopefully with uh, with with insights that are enabling and not just confusing. But I'll, but I have to tell you, um, the material is chilling. Um, you know, Brandon jokes, he said, you know, I, I won't be surprised if some people require therapy after watching some of it. Now, um, I don't know if it's, if it's, if it's that, if it's that of that nature, but I can tell you that looking at how some of the material has been put together, uh, in the framework of, uh, you know, the episodes, and we're talking about 
uh, I think the back of the envelope com uh, calculation was we're talking about 0.87% of the material that is actually filmed makes it into the final cut. But the stuff that I've seen tells a, uh, a very complicated, very complex, and, and in some cases, compelling story. Well, Eric, I, I truly mean it when I say that you are someone I've wanted to speak to for some time. So it's great to finally get you on three years into the podcast. Um, sure. I'll just mention season premiere of The Secret of Skinwalker Ranch is on History, Tuesday, 18th April, 10 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. Central. Do not miss it. And then for the UK folks, sorry, but it tends to come on a bit later in the year. Normally around August time, we tend to have it landing. But as and when we get dates for that, I can certainly let you know. Eric, thank you very much for your time. And it was a pleasure talking to you it's a pleasure Andy thank you that is all for this week's show thank you very much for listening please remember to leave the podcast a review on your chosen platform you can like retweet and subscribe that would all be very much appreciated the shows are being uploaded onto youtube as we speak more and more you can sign up at patreon.com forward slash that ufo podcast to access shows ad free as well please get in touch on twitter facebook instagram that ufo podcast of course, on Twitter, it's at UFO, UAP, AM. And again, folks, as always, keep looking up. You never know what you might see. It wasn't a tic tac and not quite a saucer, more like a hubcap designed by Chaucer, a little baroque and quite steampunk, like Alice was playing bass for the Parliament of Fuck. The little fucker hovered right outside of my window, and when I shoved out the screen, he made it an issue. I don't think he expected me to see his ass, but I'd had some champagne and smoked a little more. Meditative game of state full on meta. I can't imagine how it could have been any better. I got to the top of the stairs and there he was. Like, you awake? I was about to abduct you, cuz. I jumped back and nearly kissed myself. Then I climbed out the window after the elf. And I woke up in my bed and there was something on my head. And everything was weird and everything was red. And I called up my boys. They thought this was noise. They thought it was a dream. They thought it was my toys. They thought it was my problems. And they think I should take care of me. And I don't know what it is because it doesn't really scare me.